My name is Brooks Buser, and I am the president of Radius International, and today I'm going to talk to you about church planting movements. Church planting movements is a recent theology that works itself out in a methodology for planting churches around the world. And planting churches is the goal of the Great Commission. We see that clearly from Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the verse that follows after verse 19 where it says, therefore, go and make disciples. So planting churches is really the goal of the Great Commission. And church planting movements is attempting to do that. And today I'm going to talk to you about three concerns that I have with church planting movements uh, about their three main methodologies, person of peace, discovery, Bible studies, and obedience-based discipleship. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a better methodology. And then I'm going to give you some resources to hopefully read and to know about so that you can protect yourself from not only bad methodologies, but hopefully towards good methodologies. You can bend yourself to that if you're thinking about getting into missions or sending people who are getting into church planting among unreached people groups. Uh, the first three of church planting movements is going to be person of peace, discovery Bible studies, obedience-based discipleship. So person of peace comes from the passage in Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 2, where Jesus sends out the 72 to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he says, enter into anyone's house who is a person of peace and stay with them and proclaim the kingdom of God. And that's where this passage comes from. That's where this methodology comes from, is that idea that there is going to be an individual in each society that will unlock kind of the, the key or be the spokesman, the front person to uh, that whole society through his friendship group, through his family. Uh, that's kind of the emphasis in church planning movements is find the person of peace. And through the person of peace, ministry will spread within that community. There's a couple problems with that. Number one is that usually overseas, I lived and worked overseas 13 years among an unreached people group. It's the awkward people of a society that are first attracted to an outsider, to someone who doesn't know their language, doesn't know their culture, uh, hasn't lived among them. It's going to be the strange ones typically that are gonna be first attracted. So that's not necessarily a great spokesman for the gospel. And then second of all, usually this person of peace is not a believer. Otherwise, that wouldn't be an unreached people group. It's going to be someone who's an unbeliever. And the church planning methodology proponents are going to say, use that individual no matter if he's a believer or an unbeliever or a young believer in the faith. And that's a really poor methodology to use unbelievers to teach the gospel. So that's person of peace. The second major component to uh, church planning movements is called Discovery Bible Studies. And Discovery Bible Studies is where a group of people are gathered together and someone, usually the person of peace, who's being coached by the missionary who actually went to the people group, they're coaching the person of peace and he sits with a group of people, mostly unbelievers, and they go through a passage and they talk about what that passage means and how that passage should change the way they live. There's nothing wrong with that, but there are a few concerns in that number one, again, the person of peace doesn't know his Bible that well. He is sometimes, I would say most of the time, an unbeliever. And to gather other unbelievers around and to have an unbeliever teaching them, there's really some dangers in there because he's not qualified to handle the scriptures. Paul's very clear with Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be qualified to teach others. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. we're looking for faithful men and women, but ones who are qualified to teach the scriptures. Do they know what they're talking about? And that's one of the dangers of church planning movements. The other major, major danger is that these gatherings of people, sometimes believers, many times unbelievers, are being labeled as churches. And that's not a church. A church is something very, very different. It is not a gathering of unbelievers, and it's not someone who doesn't preach and teach the Word. That's the hallmark of a church. They preach and teach the Scriptures. They practice baptism in the Lord's Supper. They gather together as an entity that is gathered around one particular identity, 
and they have qualified leadership, leadership that the Bible recognizes as men who are qualified to lead. And so a Discovery Bible study is not a church, but it's being labeled many times as churches. And so you see many of these Discovery Bible studies going, and that's where you hear these stories of hundreds and thousands of people getting saved, or hundreds and thousands of churches being planted, when in fact these are gatherings many times of unbelievers. And that's just not a good definition of a church. The third component to church planting movements is called obedience-based discipleship. And obedience-based discipleship is kind of the fruit of Discovery Bible studies. And what happens in obedience-based discipleship is people will listen to what's being taught and slowly over time the way that they live and the things that they say, okay, these are aspects I need to change based off of these stories that I'm hearing. And that change will happen or they'll be pressed into changing some of their behaviors because of what they're learning. Now there's some of you who are familiar with the scriptures recognize immediately one of the dangers of this. It's not a foregone conclusion, but it's a massive danger that when you get people together and you tell them if you change your behavior, then you will start to move closer to Christ. And that's really not what we see in scripture. Again, Romans 8.8 8 says this, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Unbelievers people without the Holy Spirit illuminating Scripture to them, but also not reconciled to God yet. These are still unbelievers. They're outside of the community of faith. They are not able to do things that are able to please God in any way, shape, or form. Scripture is really clear on that. The other danger for obedience-based discipleship is that they don't see salvation as being a point in time. It's a process, and this is a church planting movement, kind of a, a point that they have that the process of growing towards understanding Christ, growing in your salvation, and salvation happens somewhere in there, but the point in time is really irrelevant. And scripture would kind of stand against that, that moving from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, having this burden on my back and then it's released. These are metaphors that speak to a point in time where I was a child of Satan and now I'm a child of God. I am adopted son and daughter. That changes someone radically. That's not a process. You know exactly when that happens because now you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, in Him, in Him alone, and not your works. And so that's one of the dangers of obedience-based discipleship. Again, that third component to church planting movements. At the school where I teach at, uh, Radius International, a lot of times people ask us, what would be a better methodology? And let me explain to you really briefly, and again, this is what we practiced, my wife and myself, among an unreached people group called the Yembi Yembi for 13 years. What would be a better practice? So a better practice, just again, really quickly in outline form. Number one, learn the language of the people group that you're going to. Learn it to full fluency so you don't create syncretism, the mixing of their established religion with the introduced religion. So you don't get displacement, you get mixture. And if you don't learn their language and culture, you almost always get syncretism. Learn their language and culture to full fluency and then teach them the Word of God. Don't start in Matthew, don't start in Mark, don't start in Romans, start at Genesis 1. 1-1. One, one. Walk them through the biblical narrative. Walk them through slowly Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. If someone doesn't understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will not make sense. It won't be sweet because you don't know why this Jesus has come. What is he saving you from unless you understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3? And so walking them through slowly the Old Testament narrative, walking them through the life of Christ, why Jesus cared for the poor, why he loved the downtrodden, why he cared for ones who the rich and the powerful put in the secondary category, and then how he died on the cross and he saved us from our sins. And now we are brought into a right relationship with God, Jesus or God the Father saw what Jesus' sacrifice was and he raised him back from the grave seeing that that sacrifice was sufficient. Teach them that in their language and culture and then gather the ones who believe that message into a church and teach them what it means to be the body of Christ and then gather the leaders and disciple them and teach them. My wife and I moved into the location where we were at and we taught. It took us three years to learn their language. 
Then it took us another two years to teach them sufficiently to where we had a church. And then it took us eight years to take them from being a small infant church to being a strong, mature, reproducing church. And that's the longest process because we don't want to have to have our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren going back in there someday because the church wasn't established strongly. The biggest thing that we see coming out of church planning movements is weak or fake churches. Churches that rise and fall and we go back in two years, five years, and there's nothing there. That's the biggest danger in church planning movements. It goes too fast and the people who think they're Christians, the churches that think they're strong, or the Discovery Bible studies, they're non-existent in two to five years. I don't want that to happen with you. I don't want that to happen for people that you send. And to go and to learn the language and culture and to teach slowly through the scriptures, that's the antidote to weaker churches. And so that would be the example that we would give to press into this. Four things that I would do to avoid the pitfalls of birthing fake churches or birthing people who think they're Christians but they're not actually Christians to getting away from that. Four things that I would do. Number one, we've already talked about this, learn the language and culture of the people that you're going to. In order to do that, you're going to have to get good training. How do you learn a language that's never been written down before? There are organizations out there, Radius International is one of them, I'll say that, but there are others as well. Learn the language and culture of the people that you're going to. Have a well-developed knowledge of the gospel. What is and isn't the gospel? Can you articulate the gospel in 30 seconds or less? What is the gospel and what isn't the gospel? If you're going to take the gospel somewhere where it's never been before, I would encourage you to be really clear on what that is. Theo theologians call that soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. To be really clear in your soteriology, that would be number two. Number three, have a really good definition of what a church is. I would not join a sending organization. I wouldn't join a church. I wouldn't join any Christian organization that didn't have a definition down on paper on their website, what is a New Testament church? And that's a real danger because if the church is everything, then anything you do that involves some aspect of the Word of God is now labeled a church. That's a huge danger. You don't want to birth fake churches. I don't want you, and most especially the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want you birthing fake churches. That is not helpful to the cause of Christ. Have a good definition of what a church is and what a church isn't. And then the fourth thing would be to read good books. So I'm going to recommend some books to you that hopefully will be helpful to you, not only in understanding church planting movements, but also in understanding how previous generations of missionaries practiced planting churches among unreached people groups. The first book is called John G. Payton. Uh, this is a book about a missionary that went to the New Hebrides, is what it was called back then. Uh, he established a church, went through tremendous obstacles, lost his wife in the first year that he was on the island, and continued to press on. Just an incredible story. This is one for the ages. I would highly recommend this book. And then the second one is To the Golden Shore by Courtney Anderson. This is the life of Adoniram Judson. This is an incredible resource. Uh, Adoniram Judson goes to the country of Burma and he actually sees God move through the country of Burma and sees churches established and he sees a lot of disciples come out of it. But the sacrifice that he went through was just incredible. I would highly recommend that one. And then this one, uh, the three Mrs. Judsons. These are the wives of Adoniram Judson, Anne, Nancy, and Emily. And these ladies, through their own words, through their letters that they sent back to their family, just the words, I remember reading this on the way from Dallas to San Diego in a plane flight and just the middle chapters, it was incredible. The way that they talk about sacrifice and the way that they talk about the worthiness of God for their lives. I would make this mandatory Christian reading for all Christian teenagers if I had it in my power. This is a wonderful resource. And then this one, a brief guide to DMM. DMM is the close cousin of church planting movements. There's four close cousins to church planting movements. Disciple making movements, 
training for trainers, T for T, and four fields. They're all very close to church planning movements, but this is the radius booklet, very short, on, on disciple making movements and some of the components that I've talked to you today about person of peace, obedience based discipleship, and discovery Bible studies. If you want it for free, just go to radiusinternational.org and then pull down the resources tab and you can pick this up. That's a helpful resource. And then, like I talked about earlier, if you don't have a well developed soteriology, what is the doctrine of salvation? What's the gospel? What does somebody need to know to be saved? This is a wonderful resource. Michael Lawrence puts together how someone, what they need to believe, what they need to understand in order to be saved and how churches do that well. And so I would highly recommend this. And then finally, The Church by Mark Dever. What is a church? What isn't a church? And what does the Bible say about the church? If you're a little bit fuzzy on, okay, I understand we don't want to make fake churches and I understand that Christians or unbelievers thinking they're Christians, that's a really bad thing. How do I not do that? This is a great resource. This will help you tremendously. Both of these books are really skinny. You can kind of see it on the camera. You can get through them fairly quickly, but I would highly recommend these to you. So, Brother, sister, I hope this is helpful for you so that your life matters. And when you get over there, you don't unintentionally do something that is the opposite of what you intended to do. There's some good aspects to church planning movement, but there's some dangerous aspects as well. Be careful and may the Lord bless you as you're a goer or you're a sender in whatever capacity he has you seeing his name made great among the nations. Lord bless you.